In the last episode, we spoke about what it takes to truly understand hemodynamics. I mean, everyone knows about the left ventricle, but to be a true master, you need to master the right ventricle. And that's what we're going to speak about today. And just as a brief review, remember the RV, it's a little bit different than the LV. It's thin walled. It doesn't like changes in volume. It doesn't like changes in pressure. It doesn't adapt well to acute changes, but chronically it can become hypertrophied and deal with stresses in the system. It also shares the interventricular septum with the left ventricle. And when things get bad, you can have a bowing of that interventricular septum into the LV causing more hemodynamic problems. And of course, don't forget about the RV dense spiral. Remember, when you have acute changes in the pulmonary arterial vasculature, like a big PE, this is going to acutely increase the afterload on that right ventricle. And that thin walled RV doesn't tolerate increases in pressure very well. So what happens? The RV dilates in response to that stress. And because the coronary perfusion is happening during systole and diastole, those coronary arteries get pinched off and they don't perfuse the myocardium very well, leading to cardiac ischemia. And with cardiac ischemia, you get decreases in contractility. Decreases in contract Tilty of that RV lead to decreased filling of the LV and a drop in your cardiac output. A drop in your systemic cardiac output leads to a decrease in your mean arterial blood pressure, which leads to a decrease in your coronary perfusion, which leads to further RV ischemia, which leads to further decreases in contractility, which leads to decreases in filling and decreases in cardiac output of your left ventricle, which leads to shock and leads to death. Don't forget about the RV death spiral. Very important to keep in mind as you're resuscitating these patients. So to resuscitate the right side of the heart, we have to focus on a couple things. The first thing is we have to identify and fix the problem. If you don't fix or reverse this problem, whether it's a PE or worsening pulmonary hypertension, you're not going to get anywhere with this circulation. The next thing you want to do is you want to optimize the plumbing. And we can do this with some good old fashioned resuscitation as well as some medications, which we'll talk about. Now, what do I mean by plumbing? I mean that you have an RV over here and then you have your LV over here. And in between them, there's the pulmonary arterial vascular system. System. A couple things can go wrong. The first problem that can happen is that you can have RV ischemia. If we have a decrease in our pump, it's going to decrease blood flow getting across here and into our LV, and that's going to lead to problems. We can also have a situation where we have a buildup of too much fluid. If we give too much crystalloid as we're resuscitating patients, or there's volume overload for any of a variety of reasons, this can lead to an increased stretch of that right ventricle. Remember, that RV ventricle doesn't like volume, and it can't handle increases in pressure very much. So what happens? This RV will dilate and will not perform as well as when it's normally sized. The next problem is we can have increases of resistance in the connection be between the right ventricle and the left ventricle, namely the pulmonary arterial system. And this can happen in a variety of ways. Pulmonary embolism can cause an obstruction of flow, but also releases a lot of thromboxanes and cytokines, all things that cause further vasoconstriction of the system, increasing the resistance to flow across. And as we said before, the right-sided system doesn't like increases in resistance. It's a low resistance, low pressure type system. If you have a person who has hypoxemia, the pulmonary arteries vasoconstrict to try and shunt blood around to better perfused parts of the lungs, and this leads to an increased vasoconstriction. Hypercarbia does the same thing. And finally, patients who are acidotic will also have an increase in our pulmonary artery vascular resistance, or we'll just call this PVR from here on out. Obviously, you can have a backup of flow over here, whether it's due to acute valvular problems, like acute MR, or it's due to LV failure. Either way, there's a backup backup of flow over here, and this is going to lead to problems downstream, causing increases in resistance and increases in volume in this entire system. So that leads to problems because, again, the right-sided system can't handle these changes acutely. So that takes us to step number one. You got to fix the problem. So you have to try and identify what's wrong with the person. If the person has a massive PE, then you need to lyse the person. If the person's having RV ischemia, they need to go to the cath lab and get that coronary reperfused. If they have hypoxemia, fix the hypoxemia. If they're acidotic, fix the acidosis. If there's an acute left-sided problem, we'll fix that left-sided problem. Now, it's not always going to be obvious what these problems are. Now, how are you going to figure out what's going on? I recommend you use ultrasound, but even then, it might not be obvious. So while you're waiting to diagnose and then fix the problem, you'll have to jump ahead to step number two, and that's to optimize the plumbing while you're figuring things out. Now, what does that mean? If you're having a problem of the right ventricle pumping, you're going to increase inotropy. And there's a few medications that can help you with this. I personally like to use low dose epi. Epi in low doses is a good inotrope. What's the dose for low dose epi? We're talking about 0.01 to 0.05 mics 
per kilo per minute. As you increase the dose of epi above this, it becomes more of a vasopressor and less of an ionotrope. So I try to keep it low dose and I don't titrate it at this dose. We also have things like dobutamine, also good ionotrope. The problem is, is you can get into arrhythmias and it's not the cleanest drug. And then finally, we have milrinone. Milrinone is a great ionotrope. The problem is, is that it can cause some systemic hypotension if you're not careful. So this is a difficult drug to be titrating in the emergency department. Maybe best for upstairs when you can keep a closer eye on the hemodynamics of the patient. But what's important to remember is as you're resuscitating this person, we want to increase the right ventricular squeeze to push more blood across. The next thing we want to do is we want to make sure that there's good coronary perfusion to this RV. We want to make sure that there's blood flow and that the RV is happy. And the way we do this is by increasing mean arterial pressure. Now, not all vasopressors are equal. For example, something like phenylephrine might increase the mean arterial pressure, but it also increases the pulmonary vascular resistance. And this will work against us as we're trying to move blood from the right side over to the left side. On the other hand, something like nor epi at lower doses increases the mean arterial pressure and may not cause increases in our pulmonary vascular resistance. Even better is to use something like vasopressin, which has been shown to increase our mean arterial pressure as well as decrease our pulmonary vascular resistance. So this would be my go-to drug if I have a low mean arterial pressure and I'm trying to vasodilate the pulmonary arterial system to promote blood flow. The next thing we wanna do is we wanna work on this system specifically. And the easiest way to do that is to give the person supplemental oxygen if the person's hypoxemic, to ventilate off CO2 if the person is hypercarbic, and minimize acidosis if the person is acidotic. Reversing these problems might cause enough vasodilation to permit blood flow across. Sometimes you have to add medications that will help this person along, of which there are a couple options. You can use things like inhaled nitric oxide, which is very expensive, but works very well at causing vasodilation of the pulmonary system. You can use things like epoprosinol, which works in a different manner than nitric oxide, also causes vasodilation here, but is much cheaper, much more affordable. Going back to milrinone, which again is a right ventricular inotrope, it can also cause vasodilation here, whether you give it intravenously for the inotropic doses, or you can also do this inhaled, which will work more specifically on the pulmonary arterial system. And then finally, there is some evidence that you can use nebulized nitroglycerin, which will also cause pulmonary arterial vasodilation. Less data on this, but it's out there and you should know about it. Now, once you optimize the inotropy, and once you optimize the MAP, and once you decrease PVR, the last thing you can try to do is remove volume from the RV if the RV is truly distended and the system is volume overloaded. The way you do this is with diuresis or with dialysis. Now I will say that I won't be removing any fluids in a person who's actively hypotensive. It's better to resuscitate them first and then pull volume off, but you might find yourself in a situation where you do have to pull volume off that right ventricle when the person's a little soft on their blood pressure. And for this, you just got to trust me. When you have an RV that is ballooned out because there's too much volume overload, the myocardial fibers are not contracting well together, you have to reduce the volume of that RV and allow those fibers to perform much better and you'll get much better ionotropy. So by removing volume out of the RV, systolic performance is going to get much better. So again, I know this sounds crazy, but giving diuretics to a patient who's already hypotensive when you know the RV is volume overloaded will actually make the person better hemodynamically. So let me go ahead and summarize this and bring it back home. When you know that the person's right ventricle is not performing optimally, you have to identify and reverse the problem. If you're not quite sure what the problem is or you're waiting for the appropriate therapy to reverse the problem, there are things you can do in the meantime. You wanna increase the inotropy of the RV. You can do this with milrinone, you can do it with dobutamine, my personal favorite, low-dose epinephrine. 60% of the time, it works every time. The next thing you wanna do is open up the pipes over here. You can do this by minimizing hypoxemia, decreasing hypercarbia, and minimizing acidosis, and then you can also use some drugs that will help you out using direct arterial vasodilators. The ones that we use are inhaled nitric oxide, epoprostenol, milrinone that's inhaled or intravenous, or nitroglycerin. Don't forget you also wanna focus on the mean arterial systemic pressure here, because if you increase the mean arterial pressure, you're going to get better coronary perfusion. That's going to make the right ventricle perform better systolically and get more blood across. Additionally, there are certain agents like vasopressin and norepi at lower doses that will increase your mean arterial pressure and decreasing the pulmonary vascular resistance, specifically with things like vasopressin. And then finally, and I know this sounds a little bit crazy, but giving these patients diuretics to unload the right ventricle when there's volume overload is the way to make 
make these patients better. You're going to have to optimize all these other things first, but giving patients diuretic and unloading that right ventricle, although it sounds crazy, is the best way to optimize performance of that right ventricle because the right ventricle performs better when it's smaller and decompressed and not congested with a lot of fluids. Speaking of fluids in the RV, people will always ask, well, how do I resuscitate the RV? Should I give them fluids? Should I withhold fluids? And if I give fluids, how much should I give? This could be challenging to answer, but the best way of approaching these patients is not to give them a liter or two of fluid as we normally do when we're resuscitating the left heart. What we'd like to do is give small aliquots 250 cc boluses at a time and continuously checking the hemodynamics to make sure you're doing the right thing. If you give this person smaller aliquots of fluid and their hemodynamics are not improving, then it's a good indication that you want to withhold fluids on this person. So I'm not saying not to give fluids in the RV that's not working well. You just have to be very judicious because the RV doesn't handle lots of volume very well. So when in doubt, give smaller aliquots, but more frequently than you would when you're resuscitating the LV. Okay, so that's part two of the hemodynamics in the RV. In part three, we're going to talk about what happens when you have to intubate the person who has pulmonary hypertension or RV dysfunction. These fall into the category of the physiologically difficult airway, but don't worry. I'm going to take you through a step-by-step -step approach to these patients so you can do it more safely when you need to do it. Please don't forget to hit that subscribe bell so you don't miss the next episode. And please, please, please like this video if you enjoyed it. Don't break my heart.